you very much for coming out this afternoon. Uh, you're here, we're here to talk about the top 10 breakthrough technologies. I'd like to start by introducing my panel. Uh, James Baker from Michigan Tech University. Cindy Bott from Huntington Miller Schwartz & Cohn. Rich Chilla from MSU Technologies. Kristen Murphy from Brooks Cushman. And myself, Milton Roy, uh, moderator of MIT Enterprise Club of Great Lakes. What we'd like to do today is to walk through uh, the Technology Review magazine. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's MIT's Magazine of Innovation. It's one of the most widely read magazines of technology and manage technology management in the world. Um, they have an annual issue that talks about the top 10 breakthrough technologies. And their aim is to cover technologies that they feel will really have a major impact on the world. Not just commercialization, but really change what's going on around. So our purpose today is to talk about that top 10, to give you what we think are our top five as they pertain to Michigan, then to leave room at the very end for your questions and hopefully our answers. So we will be looking for some audience participation, so we will get right to it. So looking at then the top 10 breakthrough technology. Uh, the first one that we'll start with is smart watches. That's our number one. Uh, I'm going to start with Kristen. Are smart watches a fashion fad, or are they really a growth industry? I think they're both. <laughs> um, part of the issue when I first was looking at the top ten technologies, you know, I really like the, uh, I'm not loud enough, I thought I was going to a loud voice. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I like about the smart watches is because um, as a woman, uh, I don't walk around with my phone clipped to my belt because we don't wear them very often. <laughs> so that leaves the option of putting these, putting your purse or putting your phone in your purse, uh, which means if it rings, you have to find it. And it I'm Murphy, Murphy's Law. It's going to be in the bottom <laughs> under every single thing, everything else that's in there. Um, by the time I find it, it's not ringing anymore. And of course, I'm compulsive and I need to check my email at least, you know, 20, 30 times in a minute, so I'm constantly trying to pull it out, look at it, pull it out. So that leaves the point where you're walking around holding it. That interferes with eating and drinking, obviously. <laughs> so the idea that we could have something to wear that would allow, satisfy my compulsive need to, is somebody looking for me? <laughs> is my phone ringing? Do I need to call anyone? Uh, I've got four kids. Is there some kid that needs to be picked up somewhere that I completely forgot about? Um, is intriguing just because you can have a quick place to look. Uh, the problem, of course, I want it to look nice. And, you know, I want it to blend with my other jewelry that I'm wearing or match my outfit because, you know, I'm a girl. And we think like that sometimes. So um, what I thought would be intriguing is I looked at some of the patents that have been filed or applied for some of the published applications. And in particular, uh, for the main inventors of the leading smart watch, um, which is the Pebble smart watch that had come out last year, or two years ago, I believe. Um, they relaunched the latest one. They are the front runners. So I looked up this guy. His earliest application filing date was in 2009. So that tells me that the technology that they've been working on to the point to get it to here was really uh, developed five years ago. So when you're looking at um, a product for future growth industry, um, you're not going to define the basic concept, the broad concepts behind the, the smartphone. But what you can develop are the enhancements. I see that one of the downfalls for the smartwatch so far is that there's not a lot of apps that work with it. So for um, very entre entrepreneurial people, app development for smartwatches in a very small space using Bluetooth technology will be a growth industry. Design. You know, we don't often uh, talk about design patents very much. They're considered the um, you know, younger, less important uh, child of the utility patents. But design patents have teeth. Just uh, look at the Apple and Samsung fight over the design of the phones. Uh, they have a lot of teeth, and I think that that's where you'll see, especially if you're going to tar target the women demographic, 
you're going to have to get away from the utilitarian look and make it look a little bit more um, feminine or have some options for how it will look. The other thing to consider too when looking at uh, developing these apps or, or other peripheral uh, devices that can work with a smartwatch, um, you have to think about what kind of software you're going to use. Are you going to use open source software? If you are, you need to make sure that your use of any potential products that you're going to put out in the marketplace is compliant with the agreement. A little box you clicked when it said, you know, would you like to use this? Those words do matter, <laughs> and you have to look at that. Um, so there's making sure that you're compliant with the open source licenses that they give you if you want to use that technology in the marketplace is very important. Great. Thank you. So that was the first of our top five, if you will. Next up is super grants. Uh, if renewable energy has an Achilles heel, it's that the power supply is usually over here, and power demand is over here. There requires either some method of storage or portability. So Jim, tell us a little bit about super grids and where that technology is going. Sure, so, so super grids are kind of the interstate highway system for power. Uh, that's the cleanest analogy. And, and I was recently talking about distributed power with one of our power people. And they, they use a different analogy, which made a heck of a lot of sense to me, is that the power grid from, from creator to consumer is a funnel. So if you're pushing power back up that funnel, you're literally pouring into an upside down funnel. So moving power from a distributed source back to the main grid and then to the super grid once it's built out, uh, severely limits distributed power. Lots of line losses as well as just the simple capacity for that line to, to carry the power. To bring that further a little home, I have lots of colleagues that have, we live in a remote area, power reliability is an issue. They have their own distributed generation system, solar, wind, and they're frustrated with how little power the utilities have to buy back from them. And there are business reasons for that, but there are also technical reasons for that. Because there is a small line going from their house back to the main grid, that line can only deliver so much. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in real-time power electronics and real-time distribution to help manage this phenomenon. How do we have interstates that connect with the back roads in an efficient way so that you can move the traffic, move the electrons from where they're generated to where they're being consumed? Thank you. How many people in this room have been to Las Vegas before? Raise your hands. Everyone knows about this app. What happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. But what about social media? How do you retract or not put out something you don't want everyone to see? So, Cindy, can you help us out a little bit? What's the solution in terms of temporary social media? Well, so the MIT review is focusing on Snapchat. And Snapchat, I have not used, but it kind of fits into the advice that I try to give to my children is that what you put on the web stays there. And this may be how they're going to come back and say, hey, I use Snapchat. How many people here have ever used Snapchat? So one person, so you're my gener this the generational issue, I think. So, so the, um, this mobile app, lets people have control over how long a particular picture or message will last. So by the way that they use this mobile app, you press down on the button and you send your message and you can decide whether the person who receives it is going to look at it from 1 to 10 seconds and then it, poof, it goes away and it's removed from Snapchat's um, server. And so hopefully it's gone. And this apparently is a very easy. Okay. <laughs> hopefully, I'll tell you in a minute why I say hopefully. So, so this clearly is a very um, lucrative area to be in. Facebook offered upwards of a, of like a billion dollars to acquire this technology, and Snapchat said, not interested. And so Facebook went out and made their own version called Hope, which I know nothing about before I started looking into this. So how does this work, um, and what are the issues involved? And so really it's a, it's a software technology, and 
how it might be circumvented is that within those 10 seconds, there's a possibility somebody could use a screen capture and keep your picture. Or you could even have your phone here and you take a picture of the picture. And so right now, even though the users get notified if their screenshot has been made of their picture, they don't have any real way of getting that picture back. So where I see this technology being developed further is to figure out a way to decrease the chance that that can happen. And, you know, again, it's software. Can you change the ability of the timing, the clicking off, if it gets challenged in some way? I don't know how that's going to happen. But, again, the mobile apps are really developing quickly. And we'll see between Facebook and Snapchat whether we're going to see an ability to even further reduce the privacy issues. And I think this technology is particularly hot right now in the after the aftermath of Edward Snowden's um, <laughs> and how activities are, um, let's see, to the level that we're concerned with privacy of quite a bit. And so I think this technology is going to be developed in other areas as well as people try to avoid um, the disclosure that otherwise might be made. I think that we'll be circling back this whole issue of privacy and ethics with a couple more of our technologies. But wait a second, thank you. When I saw memory implants, these are the two pictures that came to mind for me. I'm sure everyone here has seen Total Recall and Johnny Mnemonic. Um, but in the real world, this is really important stuff. So this brings us to the second of our top five technologies, which is memory implants. So Kristen, what's happening with this technology? There was a doctor, and this is a perfect life lesson for anybody. There's a doctor out in California who decided that he was going to develop um, a way to provide all-timer patients with a way of accessing lost memories. Um, as we see, and everybody told him he was crazy. He spent the last 35 years working on this. And, and now he's actually developed technology that is, is making this a very, very real possibility. It's not been tested in humans yet. Um, but they're having success with some, uh, I think it's rats and mice, that they've been able to uh, track how the, how the memory processes, the flows in the brain work, the neurons. And so this is fascinating um, for the potential to be able to tap into lost memories. I mean, how many times have you gone to, you run into somebody that you know you've seen them before, you can't remember their name. <laughs> I mean, and like, I know them, I know them, and you don't want to be embarrassed by telling them, never, at least the lawyer of me will never admit anything. <laughs> but um, try to pick around the edges of where did you last see them until that comes to, to pass. I look at this memory implant, yes, it's highly important for uh, disease, um, like Alzheimer's patients, as well as stroke victims who lose access to part of their long-term memories. But just being able to generate, I can see the application for the future of being able to generate um, kind of your own personal database of things that you need to keep. Now, I don't know how that would work. <laughs> but um, so there's a lot of interesting concepts of how you can take this further to not just to, to address disease, but also address everyday life or things that you need to remember, things that you particularly want to remember every single detail about the birth of your first child, your second child, or in my case, one four, <laughs> your, the wedding of your, um, your, your wedding day, the, the proposal day, all the big events in life that um, matter to you personally and how you can store them. Now, as far as where do I see some industry building up around this technology in particular, one of the uh, medical device applications, I've done a lot of them in, in particular in the um, neurosurgical field. Um, in particular, it's always a hotbed of activity because people are looking for more and more creative ways to do things. 
So from the device standpoint, there's a lot of opportunity. How can you make it smaller? I also see it's not just about the device itself, but how do you get it in there, into the brain, without destroying all the other functionality of, of the brain um, to implant it in the right place. There are other technologies being developed for minimally invasive uh, surgery to address tumors that before people are walking out of a hospital 24 hours after having brain surgery. That wasn't possible five years ago. Now it is. So you can see that some of the aspects of how you're going to implant it, how you're going to get it to stay at a particular location in the brain, and how you're going to hook things up to mimic the uh, neural pathways in the brain. Um, there are some other considerations. Oh, do you want to address any of the potential issues that with uh, medical device work? I, I think that you're alluding to the patentability. So I think that I'm going to talk in a little bit about the fetal DNA diagnosis. And I'll bring up a little bit there, but we're probably going to no, probably put that off till later in the discussion, right? And so maybe we can circle back to that. Sure, sure. When we get to that point. Okay. Um, deep learning. It's another word for artificial intelligence. When you first think of AI, you think of how? 2001. That's never really going to happen. How many people watch Jeopardy when the Watson computer is at That was an amazing breakthrough. Um, my wife, who was definitely the boss in my household, finally said, your phone's dying too often, so she got me the new HTC. How many people have the new HTC One? What's been incredible in this, and it's spreading its way into Google Cards and everything else, I dictate into this a note to myself, the registration is 100%. To me, that's incredible. That is all deep learning. It's artificial intelligence. It's right here, right now. So that's the technology that Google has already been putting into their new phones. The technology that Watson used is already being used in the medical device field, which is in the medical field. They're rolling out to a number of hospitals as an expert consultant for doctors and nurses about five different hospitals across the country. So from 2001, deep learning is actually already taking place, which is pretty phenomenal. So, uh, next one up. Uh, Ultra-efficient solar power. Um, solar power unit costs are dropping. So what's the big thing about this solar power? And where, where is system costs going? Richard? Yeah, sure. As you said, uh, solar power costs are dropping. The reason is this is actually, it's hard to think of it now, but in, in our lifetime, solar power has actually become quite a mature technology. The, the basics have been around a long time. Of course, what, what happens is we have special materials that collect light from the sun and convert that to, to, to electrical current. And both the, 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 the materials, the processes for producing the solar cells, the solar cells, all those costs have actually come down quite a bit. And that, you know, for middle class, for middle class homes in the right part of the country for the right application, it's very, very common to, for them to install solar panels. But the typical solar cell is, depending on, uh, on the, uh, the type of materials used, you, know, you may be talking between 27 and 31 percent efficiency, solar efficiency, in converting the, uh, the energy from the, from the sunlight into electrical energy. What ultra-efficient uh, solar panels are doing is, think of it as, um, as if you pass the light first through a, a prism and broke the light into its constituents' colors. So it's taking the sunlight, breaking it into its colors, and then each color is using a material and a circuit that is electronically tuned for that wavelength of light. And so by doing that, it's felt that you can, you can actually boost the, uh, the capture levels from that high 20s, 30%, up to, up to uh, the next level, because you'll have a, a special cell, a spe sorry, a special material tuned for red, or tuned for blue, or tuned for indigo. So, yeah, that's sort of it, it in a nutshell. It's felt that's the next uh, that's the next plateau. A lot of opportunities for IP development here, both in materials and in processes and technology for breaking those spectrum apart and then recombining them. Prenatal DNA sequencing. The earlier you know something, the earlier you can do something about it. 
Cindy, this is the third of our top five technologies. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on with this and why it's viewed as being such an important advance? Right, so I think that this is a really important advance, particularly when you consider the other genetic and biotechnology um, technologies we have for medical devices, for just medical tests in general. And so the medical technology and the ability of the doctors to be able to diagnose and treat um, is really increasing. I want to tell you about the technology a little bit in that what the, what the company Illumina is doing is using their sequencing power. They essentially started out as a as DNA sequencing um, company. And they bought another company who was looking at how they could use a non-invasive technique for diagnosing various conditions. And for an example, I'll use Down syndrome, which is trisomy 21. And how could you figure out how to not have to use amniocentesis to determine the chromosomal makeup of the fetus? And so the technology it's based on, it really is not that new. In 1997, it was found that there was fetal DNA, little bits and pieces of fetal DNA circulating in the mother's bloodstream along with her own. But at that time, there was really no way of using that. It was very interesting. But what's changed since then really is our computational abilities. But the amount of, of data that's needed to be analyzed to really look and try to recreate the fetus's genome from those little bits and pieces of DNA is pretty daunting. And so with the advances in sequencing technology, it's starting to become a reality that we can recombine all those bits and pieces, take it out of the context of the mother's own DNA, and figure out what, you know, what that fetus has as far as defects in their genome. And so let's say, for instance, what's What's been done so far has been to try to do just multiple sequencing. That's one of the real difficulties with this. In order to bring it out of the background of the mother's DNA, there have to be hundreds and hundreds of sequencing events. And then that sequencing has to be tied together in a way that it makes any sense. And so the first attempt to do this to get one fetal gen genome from that data cost $50,000. And that was done at the University of Washington. The company that started um, this technology, the guy who started it, his lab tried, and they ended up stopping because it cost so much. So we're not quite there yet. And we we may get there, again, this um, person who started the company is now looking at focusing on the most important genes and really trying to, to condense the amount of sequencing down to a smaller amount to where the cost might go down. So in, the, in this case, it may be a, not a matter of you know, if we can do this. Surely in the coming years, we're going to figure out how to make the technology rise to the speed and capacity that we need to recombine that genome. But the question really is, when will it be a viable technology commercially? Um, one of the issues that comes up, obviously, are ethical concerns. When you do have that fetus's entire DNA, it's great from a medical perspective. You can diagnose whether there's more copies of the chromosome 21 and decide whether that child is at risk for Down syndrome or actually has Down syndrome as a fetus. And the mother has options then, the family has options then, that raise some real ethical concerns, particularly these days with all the concern around abortion and the factions associated with that. Longer term, the ethical issues may be more of what we can choose in our child. Um, and so really difficult ethical um, decisions there, which I think at the end of the panel, if people want to discuss it more and there's time allowed, um, we can discuss that some more.
Same thing goes for the IP, although we're going to put it off at the end. There are a lot of IP opportunities here because of the sequencing technology and all the improvements needed there is an I, are IP opportunities. There are also IP challenges based on some recent Supreme Court cases, and I could talk about that for days. But, um, <laughs> and, you know, in, in general, it's just the area of DNA has become a hotbed for um, Supreme Court activity in ways that I would prefer they would meddle in, but we can get to that later. Um, <laughs> Kristen may have some comments on that as well. Um, and so, you know, I think that there definitely is, because of the commercial possibilities and the dollars involved in having these non-invasive um, techniques for assessing a child's propensity to have certain diseases, um, this really is going to come to a commercial reality. Also, another area that it's useful for, even after, um, you know, after um, a child is diagnosed with cancer, this technology can be used. You know, the full genome sequencing can be used to try to identify genes that might be useful in knowing about, you know, what uh, treatment options there might be. There's a lot of these um, add-ons ideas that once you know a child's genome, maybe you know it as a fetus, going forward, if that child has some issues, it might be possible to figure that out from their genome that you already have. Great, thank you. I look forward to the discussion when we reach the end of this particular part of what we're doing. Uh, the first medical device forum that we did under our new uh, format we had four companies plus a medical emphasis. And it was a very fascinating discussion. I know that different colleges and universities, and I look forward to seeing which of your colleges doing it, are starting to bring ethics into design and product. So we'll definitely come back and touch on that some more. And, and I thought maybe Rich had a little bit to offer about what's going on at MSU with regard to this um, DNA technology with Theta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, if we just have like one uh, 30 seconds, what we did, what would is an active area of research for us right now is taking the technology as Cindy described, it's actually being used in a, in a I guess, a, an area that's more commercially oriented, less fraught with difficulty. It's being used uh, to determine uh, egg quality in, uh, for in vitro fertilization of, of bovine and for horses. And so, actually, it's a big, the ag industry in this area is very, very big. Breeding of cattle and breeding of racehorses is very, very large. And this actually reduces the cost by helping to uh, identify more viable eggs for in vitro fertilization. Thank you. Um, next up, big data. Um, there are a lot of strong feelings about NSA listening and our privacy, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. But there were also some fascinating developments coming along recently in the use of big data for what could be considered as cheap phones in aggregate. Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about some of those? Sure. Um, that out in like third world countries where uh, the, the phone quality probably is or <laughs> less signal towers are available, um, there is a, I can't see the, epi, epi, she, she deals with uh, breakouts. Yes, that's the word. There's some words I just can't say. <laughs> As a patent attorney, I, I, I like to make up my own words. <laughs> The uh, uh, disease lady, uh, she, she came up with, was realizing that studying the signals of certain towers in these countries was enabling and comparing those, that data with um, migration habits was opened up a whole new world that was up in figuring out how diseases spread and how certain diseases spread. And for her, um, this light bulb said, well, we could do some prevention messages to these phones automatically when certain people are within the tower ranges to alert them, this is a high malaria uh, area that you're entering. These are the type of nettings that you should use when in this area. And so there are some good that can come from anonymous data gathering to, to push out some of these messages and develop um, programs to reduce issues. I could see the same kind of technology if we can get past some of the privacy issues for traffic flow patterns. 
Wouldn't it be great if you could get a message on your phone that says your ideal time to leave for work to max to minimize your commute would be X? And that would be fascinating, especially in, in large commuter areas where that that commute is just horrendous. Perhaps Atlanta could have used it this week. That's exactly what <laughs> I was thinking about when you talked about that. Was Atlanta. Yeah. Inch and a half of snow when people are stuck for like 18 hours. They just went nowhere. So. Okay. Great. Um, this is certainly an area uh, within Michigan where robots are old news. So our first, my first thought was, what could new, what is there that's new that could be developing? But this is one of our number two technologies as deep learning and artificial intelligence make their impact. So, Jim, what is up with Baxter, the blue collar robot? Who is he or she, and what's so new about it? Sure. So, there's Baxter, <laughs> and it's it's a new industrial robot that's being developed by a startup out of MIT. And as in no reference, industrial automation is old school, especially in this state. We've been doing that for a long time. And and in the, in the early generations of robots, they were really good at doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and then as machine vision and other things uh, evolved, they, they became good at doing very predictable things, non-routine, but very predictable, very easily characterizable things, uh, very efficiently. Uh, Baxter is, is another generation yet in uh, machine automation. And just as, as a backdrop in terms of, and this probably goes without saying particularly in this state, but the importance of machine automation, I, I don't have recent statistics, but I, I continue to be struck by a comment shortly after the downturn. So the downturn was nearing the bottom of the trough, and I saw a presentation by a, an economist for Comerica who said at that point had data that the state of Michigan GDP for manufacturing had actually increased during the downturn. The difference was humans weren't doing it. So the product leaving the state, the product being created, the value being created within the state was increasing, but the payroll was decreasing because of automation. And we went through this when farming industrialized, and so we, we've seen these. And so now Baxter is enabled largely by the proliferation of cheap sensor technology and the advance of machine vision technology, we now have a robot who, who somewhat you know, colloquially looks like a human, has uh, force feedback in it. So when Baxter goes to do something, if you're standing next to him, he doesn't knock you over. He knows you're there, and he stops pushing. If Baxter goes to set something down, and there's something underneath it, he doesn't crush the thing that's underneath it. He stops. So he can now configure his work mode to the environment, to the part that he's working with, to, to whatever happens, whether it's a disruption in the automation process or whether it's a non-routine process that now Baxter is enabled to do. He also has, as you see, he has a face. So you have a quick and easy diagnostic mechanism. You know, when he's happy, his eyes are happy. When he's not happy, his eyes aren't happy. His head moves to where he's going. His eyes move. He tells you what he's doing. So it's much friendlier from uh, kind of cohabitation with traditional workers and robots. Um, it can be trained again, enabled by sensors. Um, instead of having to program Baxter, you can just show Baxter what to do and train him how to do either a routine task or non-routine. Um, so a tremendous opportunity for revolution in how we think about automation, how we use automation, and, and as the technology that enables the future Baxters of the world, tremendous opportunity for better vision technologies, better sensing technologies, uh, but as well as what can you make now that you couldn't make cost effectively before this new robust robot was created. Great. We have one blue box left. So we kind of wrestled with what order to put these in. And what I thought was that this, new, this technology we're going to talk about, even probably more than nanoscale manufacturing, has been described as the next industrial renaissance. So Rich, we're going to let you end this portion of the program with telling us what's up with our number one technology, which is additive manufacturing. Yeah. Thanks, Milton. So additive manufacturing, this is all about using uh, 3D printers. So most of you may have some idea what a 3D printer is, but if you know what an inkjet printer is, it's very easy to understand a 3D printer. 
So when an inkjet printer prints, it, it uh, shoots the ink on a substrate, and the substrate is moving below it, and it adds one layer. Well, all a 3D printer is, is it will go then, the substrate will go back, it will keep building up that shape layer by layer. Instead of shooting ink in a 3D printer, most commonly it's uh, shooting in a uh, UV curable monomer. So it's putting in a spraying down very, very thin layers of monomer followed by a UV light, which is curing it into plastic. And then, so the printer is a choice of putting plastic in that cell or not. And so if you think about it, you can actually construct a 3D shape complete with voids, turns, bends, holes, whatever, just by, just by letting that printer go a little bit at a time. So um, initially, when these were developed, the thought was that it could be used for prototyping. And that's what they're used for most frequently. So we have a 3D printer down at the, uh, the TIC, which is a uh, innovation center in uh, Lansing along, uh, next to my office. And it's used by startup companies for actually producing uh, prototypes of, of parts or of uh, devices. And uh, I'd, I'd love to go down there and watch the thing just kind of hum away. You know, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to sit there and watch it make parts. You can actually take a patent, uh, take a drawing from a patent, for example, feed it into the software in the computer. The computer then will go to the 3D printer and it will print out that part, whatever part was in the patent drawing. That's how sophisticated they are. Additive manufacturing takes this to the next step. So the first, man, the first time people were using these things to manufacture parts that I knew of were so-called uh, lab-on-a-chip applications. So when people wanted to make something to handle microfluidics, so very fine microfluid channels with little valves, little stops, little reservoirs, that would be built up in a, in a basically almost like a plexiglass cube by the, by the 3D printer. And I saw that happen probably around the year 2002. I thought I was at University of Wisconsin. I was watching some researchers build some of these lab on a chip for highly infectious diseases where the analysis of blood and everything could go right at the chip and it wouldn't be exposed to any human content. What this is happening, with the, the part you see here is actually a part for an aircraft, I believe. And so now the 3D printer is, is being enabled with uh, metallics and ceramic, ceramic metallics to actually form a 3D part. And this is actually more cost effective than manufacturing the part through traditional metal stamping and forming. If you look at that part, it's got a fairly complicated shape of it. And these tend to be fairly uh, exotic materials, fairly expensive materials. You can imagine that if you were doing this through normal drawing and forming, and you had to assemble the part, there's going to be lots of, uh, there's going to be lots of excess material. The molds are going to be highly uh, complicated. You're going to have to waste a lot of material. And in fact, that's probably going to have to be made in four or five different parts, which are then subsequently assembled. 3D, 3D uh, manufacturing, additive manufacturing, you don't have to do that. It just sits there and sprays that part into the shape that you see right now. Works 24-7. The printer doesn't get tired. Um, and so this is really ushering in a new, a new era for, for industrialization. It's felt that these, this type of manufacturing is going to be done for many, many parts going forward, eliminating a lot of the old stamping and forming uh, operations. I think GE Aviation has one of the theory yep. like it's an impeller. They'll go into every engine they make everywhere in the world. Correct. And it's going to be added manufacturing. That's correct. I thought, I thought what I saw was uh, making 13,000 of those a year, I think, was the number that I saw quoted, which makes sense. It's about the number of aircraft engines they probably produce. Well, that kind of gives everyone an overview of what the top 10 are. Um, we said we're going to circle back on a couple of things. Let's start with IP protectability. Um, Cindy, what are your thoughts about some of the big issues that are sort of behind a number of these technologies? Well, I'll, I'll take the fetal DNA analysis first. So, so as I said, really in that technology right now, just the idea of the fetal uh, DNA being in the mother's bloodstream is old. So there, but there are a lot of patent possibilities for the technologies for speeding up the sequencing, for analyzing the sequencing that are tied to a machine or to some software. Those really don't have as many issues right now um, for patenting. When it gets down to, though, the actual diagnosis, what's going to happen 
is that you're going to get that genome put together or the part of the genome that you need to determine if the fetus has a certain condition. For example, for trisomy 21, they look at the ratio of the uh, chromosome 21 or they look at it at a particular break point to determine whether there are more <laughs> chromosome 21 versions than there are, should be. And so they're looking at basically a simple mathematic issue once they've got the DNA and those data, they have a ratio. If you have this ratio that shows that you have trisomy 21 in the fetus, well, that fetus has Down syndrome. Well, that's a difficult thing right now with these diagnostic type tests. If they get down to that basic of the level, some recent Supreme Court decisions come into play. Now you may have heard, because it was hot in the press a couple years ago, something about this diagnostic test to determine whether women were at high risk for breast cancer or for and ovarian cancer. And I don't know, have you, were you guys exposed to that in the media? Because it was pretty big. So, so the issues there that came to the Supreme Court, um, really their decision flipped things totally as far as that ability goes. And the main issue there was that the team that patented this technology identified these particular mutations in the genes referred to as BRCA1 and BRCA2. And they, they got the, to the company Myriad um, developed a number of technologies associated with this for diagnostics. And many of those really aren't going to be impacted so much. But they also, they also patented the DNA sequence and patented as isolated DNA. And the argument was, and has been for years, that it was not a problem. That was a patentable type of subject matter. You isolated it, that was a product of man. It didn't, it didn't exist in that form before. Um, so I'm going to do a tiny primer on um, IP law. So in order for an invention to be patentable, the first hurdle is that it has to be patentable subject matter, meaning that the, that the patent um, laws say, okay, this is the right type of thing that you can patent. Once you get over that hurdle, the invention has to be new, non-obvious, and it also has to comply with rules that basically make sure that the scope of patent protection is really within line of the breadth of what the person invented, what the inventors made. Until the Supreme Court decision in Myriad in 2011, that first hurdle, the, the patentable subject matter was really low in that anything that was under the sun made by man, and that was from an early Supreme Court decision, was going to get over that hurdle. But in the Supreme Court decision, what happened is the court looked at it and said, but this DNA exists in the woman's body, and, you know, it, it, and therefore you shouldn't really be able to patent this. It came to the courts as kind of a very emotional situation in which the, the groups were saying, well, this is limiting access, people's access to figuring out whether they're susceptible to cancer based on these genes. So it's very emotional, and I think the courts took that and looked at a way to say, well, how do we make this more fair? And they came out saying that, well, this DNA, it exists in the person, even though you just pulled it out and, and it took a person to pull that out and sequence it and figure out what it was, that just wasn't enough to make it patentable. So this flips the whole biotech industry over completely whereas the expectations have been that this type of activity and use of a DNA sequence would be patentable. And there's a lot of technology involved um, in the Supreme Court's decision, and I have my own personal opinions on that that we won't get into. But, um, not with the camera running at least. Not with the camera running at least. But then, that, that case, um, another case, was um, decided right after that um, called Mayo, um, and 
In there, there's a drug and a metabolite. And the patent really was very simple in saying that, OK, you measure this metabolite. If it's above this amount, you decrease the dose of drug you're giving it. If it's below this amount, you increase the dose. And unfortunately, this case also went to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court decided, instead of looking at the other parts of the patent law, the novelty, the non-obviousness, um, which really could have, should have taken care of this, but for the patent office's um, mistake in granting this patent, they basically said, well, this correlation between the amount of the metabolite and the decision of how you treat that patient going forward, it's just a natural correlation, and you can't patent that correlation. It's the body that converts the drug to the metabolite. And so this really puts at issue the patentability of many diagnostic tests. So if we're looking at personal diagnostics, personalized medicine, to determine whether you're going to respond to a particular drug or you're not, this really raises issues in whether that is going to be a patentable um, area. Okay. All right, let me ask a couple more questions and I want to open up to some Q&A. Um, we talked about where the law is stepping in, where they shouldn't be stepping in, switching us slightly, ethical concerns. You know, as engineers, I'm an engineer, if you've been invented, you have an obligation, go ahead and do it. You know, you're filling in lack of knowledge with knowledge. But you get to a point where you reach a line and say, should you proceed further? So I'm going to start with Kristen to talk about that, and then we're going to go to the university commercialization people. Do, do ethical concerns enter into the constraints of what you are working on? Uh, on what I'm working on? Uh, no. Uh, but my, the, the things that I worked on so far are, in my opinion, for um, benefit of others in, in that, like I mentioned, the neurosurgical devices. Um, to be able to work on a device that minimizes hospital stay is less traumatic for the patient and solves um, problems for the doctors. I see that as, as win all day long. Um, I think where you really get into ethical concerns is um, being able to, to use some of that prenatal DNA testing to decide that your child is going to have um, black hair and blue eyes. Um, that's those types of, um, I think they had a name for that, like designer baby. So, years ago. <laughs> um, but I think it, it, it involves so many different concerns from um, all walks of life on what you do with information. Um, you know, and even on some of the automation stuff. I have worked on automation um, technology before, and I don't know how much of an ethical issue it is, but you understand that the more you automate, the less job opportunity there could be. Now, is that my responsibility as a patent attorney? No. Um, my responsibility is to protect what I can for clients. Um, and from the engineering perspective, uh, you're trying to advance knowledge. And you want, you're advancing knowledge for knowledge's sake. So I, I don't know whether or not you should think about lost jobs or lost quality of life. Um, but I don't know, it's very, it's, there, there's no clear answer. <laughs> um, Jim, Rich, any thoughts? Do, does that, does the issue of ethics come into anything that you're doing at the university level, in terms of commercialization? Well, one thing that, that does, that factors into um, our office is sometimes we will get inventions to us that, um, that can be patented, but we choose not to patent it. Not because it's not patentable material, but there are some inventions, many inventions. Drugs is the best example. You know, if you don't patent a drug, there's no one who is, there's no company that is going to spend the money uh, to to go through the development, the clinical trials, the regulatory uh, hurdles to bring to market. So that exclusivity is absolutely required in order to get public benefit out of it. But we do come across inventions in the university where they can have public benefit, and the benefit is potentially better if there's not a monopoly on it. And so uh, we'll either make a decision in those cases to patent it and then not exclusively license it, in other words, so that it can be widely used, 
or in case, in some cases, we will choose not to patent it in certain areas where it can be, uh, where it, so so that it can be used without the barriers of uh, patenting. And we, in fact, encourage faculty to uh, to make it publicly available rather than patenting. Yeah, I think just to echo Rich's comments that so so we're licensing office, and so the first step is, is having something to license, which means some proprietary protection. Right. Um, but inherent in our decision is. Will proprietary protection increase dissemination of the technology and will ultimately increase public benefit? So that's, that's really what university licensing offices are in the business of, is figuring out what's the best strategy to get this technology into the hands of as many, in the end, consumers, or to impact as many consumers' lives as possible. And is there a protection strategy that advances that? then yes, we'll proceed with the protection, we'll proceed with the development, we'll proceed with the licensing, maybe not exclusive, maybe exclusive, as Rich mentioned. But there are instances where we say, well, sure, it's patentable, uh, but a patent either won't have a commercial outcome, or simply the patent will not support broad-based dissemination of the technology. And then we look at other ways of doing that, because the ultimate objective is to get the technology into as many people's hands as possible, or otherwise impact as many people as possible. So ethics are inherent in what we do. Great. Do you folks have any questions? We'd like to get some of your input. Yes. Stand up, please, and voice the car a little bit. Or come to the microphone. Come to the microphone. My voice can carry, though. But I would okay. Like to I'd like to follow up on some of the discussions um, from Cindy on the biotech discuss the issues, and then it actually segued very nicely into the whole issue of commercialization. So I've been trying to understand the whole issues of patent and the ability of especially biotech that I'm working with in that area. And I was looking at the case last week, the smart gene case that came down from the Federal Circuit, which said this therapeutic process is not patentable. So when I'm working with um, in inventors and scientists, they're saying, okay, if, unless I'm doing federally funded research and then the government wants it to be out there, I'm only going to do this if I can commercialize it. And if I can't commercialize it, um, then I'm not going to do it. But to your point exactly, if it's not able to be commercialized, it may not get done. And so I don't know if the rest of you are having this issue about how do you advise somebody who's thinking about spending four years in the lab to find a fix to a problem where at the end of the day they may not be able to make any money off of it. It may be a great societal value and if it's funded by NIH or somebody like that, you know, it's still a value. But, but, that there, but if we're talking about the ability to commercialize it, you know, especially for that scientist who wants to devote uh, his or her life uh, for the next several years on it, you know, it's a very difficult uh, discussion you have with them. I'd be curious of your comments. Yeah, and it can be a very difficult decision to make because if you want to commercialize something, you have to protect your idea so that you get some period of exclusivity where you can make your profit back. So there are some difficulties right now, particularly, like I said, in diagnostics, in uncertainty as to what is going to be patentable and what patents are going to stand. And I'd love to be able to tell my clients that this is going to be patentable and this isn't. Um, but I can't do that right now because this is so early on after the Supreme Court decision. So what I try to do is I try to help the, um, help the scientists understand what I might need to make sure I can get them the best patent I can. And in one way, our discussion of that means that what I need from them is a little more specifics. Because if I know if I keep it too broad and it's just a very general, vague idea, that's probably not going to pass muster with this new one-on-one -on -one test for um, patentable subject matter. But I think that the more we know about that technology and the more that we can describe specifically about that technology, the uh, greater chance we're going to have of making a patentable claim. Now, what that might mean is that it doesn't make sense to file a patent quite as early. One of the things this is going to do is I'm going to tell my clients, well, let's file when you have your idea and we'll file some separate provisional applications adding on to your technology before we file your non-provisional patent that can actually turn into a patent. 
Um, and it's just going to have to probably have these scientists who have these great ideas spend a little bit more time in the lab. But with that extra time in the lab, hopefully they can get us a patent that's going to be enforceable and get their money back. I don't know if that, did that at all address your question as well, far as? It, it says that you have the same questions I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and, and I, like I said, I wish I could tell you. I think that it's going to be a matter, right now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to write different types of claims that hopefully as the case law develops, that at least one of those types of claims is going to be found to be patentable. I wish I had that crystal ball, because right now, that uncertainty is causing people to really question, like you said, where once upon a time they would say, oh yes, I'm going to get a patent on this and I'm going to be able to try to commercialize it, to the point where I hope I can get a patent on this, but I won't know for a few years yet whether that might actually be possible. And, and I want to draw out the point a little bit. The more you develop it, the more you know, the better claims you'll get. So you're going to have to do a little more work than you probably had to do five years ago to get to a point where you have allowable claims and then defendable claims. And, and there's, a, there's a, a speech that I give all the time um, that's somewhat surprising to people, but, but it is a version of this story. So Thomas Edison did not invent the light bulb. Thomas Edison did not patent the light bulb. He happened to have a patent to a light bulb design, but he came well after the first patent was ever filed on a light bulb design. And Thomas Edison did not sell the first light bulb. What Thomas Edison did was implemented power generation, power distribution, and light bulbs. He solved the whole problem and is now known as the guy who invented the light bulb. Of course, there's lots of flavors of this story, but if you do the, the research, um, there's, there's a long lineage to what resulted in light bulbs, incandescent bulbs. And Thomas Edison was not even born when that started and didn't have a lot to do with about 80% of the path, but he really solved the problem and commercialized the technology. So just so you know, Sir Humphrey Davy, who's who's arguably the guy who invented the light bulb, nobody knows who the heck he is. Warren De La Rue, the guy who filed the first patent application to a light bulb design, well, nobody knows who the heck he is. Joseph Swan, depending on where you go, some people know who Joseph Swan is. He's the guy that sold the first light bulb. Nobody knows who he is. So just because you have a discovery, just because you file a patent application, just because you even sell the first device, doesn't mean you're the one that's going to be the wealthiest and the famous. Um, you have to solve the whole problem and you have to really get there. So that's a, a long and probably unfulfilling answer to that question. But be an Edison and not a Davy, De La Rue, and Swan is how you overcome those issues. I, I always tell clients, you know, what, what is your business goal? Um, even just investing in patents in and of themselves, it's an expensive and a very long process. So what is your business reason for doing it? Because if there's no business reason, then I'm not sure there's a reason to do it. Well, I have time for one more question. Anybody? Don't be bashful. Okay, in that case, I um, want to thank you for coming out. The 10 Breakthrough Technologies is one of the issues from Technology Review Magazine. You go to our website, which is www.mitfbreaklakes.org, you'll find a link to that. Some of our future programs are listed here. Microbreweries, probably going to be on February 25th. Again, the technology and tasting behind it. And then we'll have uh, <laughs> people don't listen to you say technology. <laughs> they have one tasting of it. And that will be co-hosted at the same time in Arbor, Grand Rapids, and in Traverse City. And then we'll have one on space, the final point here comes up in the middle of March. So thank you for coming out. Join me in a round of applause for Jim, Cindy, Richard, and Christopher.